Good morning everybody, I've got Bobby Capuccio after two weeks off back in the UK and um, I've got a few questions for him that I think will be really relevant to you this week. So we're going to talk about small studios, there's a lot of little niche studios up. If you look at the CrossFit model and you look at yoga studios, hot yoga studios, they're opening up everywhere in large and small towns and I wanted to talk to Bobby about the threat that these studios have to the large chains and also the prospects for these studios. Are they a business that can survive or are they going to be a short-term um, um, investment? You know, with all the um, when you take into consideration membership fees, who's attending to a niche product and um, the cost of actually running a building rather than just teaching class. So if we kick off with um, how do you think the large chains fare uh, when in opposition with the new um, models? Well, when we say large chains, we have to now divide the large chains into three categories. They're the budget facilities, yeah. where for £10 or €10, Euros, you can come in for a month and you're not going to get any additional services. You're not going to get personal training. You're not going to be attended to. But if you feel that all you need is equipment and a room to do your exercises, you're fine. And then you've got the high end. These are organizations that offer a myriad of services beyond fitness. So it's not just that you'll be attended to. It's not just that you'll get an induction process that's of high value. You'll also get you know, rackets and you'll also get spa and you'll also get some cutting edge services and programs. These are the guys that are always taking risks because they are charging a bit of a premium. Mm -hmm. So they have to bring in product services and have training in-house that justifies the higher price point. And then you've got everybody in the middle where, well, you know what? We're not going to be the high end. That's not our market, but we're definitely not going to be a budget club. And I think these are the guys who are in the most precarious position in face of the studios because people do not want memberships. You know, membership is kind of analogous to last week. I wanted to hang a picture up in my room. And so I went to the shop and I went to buy a drill. And the guy wanted to tell me everything about the science and the engineer that goes into the drill. I couldn't care less about a drill. What I want is a hole in the wall about that big. The drill is a means to an end. And I think that's kind of how people feel about a membership. Mm. The, the membership model by itself is broken. And what they're looking for is an experience. And they're looking for a tangible result. And a lot of these studios that are opening now are providing highly trained people with high levels of focus. There's a lot of sense of community that, because you're not one of 2,000 members. Yeah. And there is a lot of care, attention to detail. And the service that you're paying for is actually what you're receiving. So if you're not receiving what you expect, you're out of there. So I, I think for, for the middle clubs, the chains, the, the studios are going to be a, a massive threat. Where to the budget clubs, no, because people don't want that. And to the, the high-end facilities, they're not going to be bothered. Right, yeah. So if we put that into place in the UK, we've just seen Equinox open in London, which is the, is the high high-end that you're talking about. It, it will have no impact on their business. Um, and then we've got another chain at the moment, which is called Click fitness here and um, I think the difference there they're on the same scale aren't they with pay click fitness fitness first your lower end mm -hmm. chains but what they I think the essence of it is is they have a hierarchy so there's still a management that make decisions and it's passed down and there's someone on the gym floor whereas in the niche models like your CrossFit gyms the owner is the trainer does the admin it's like there's, there's one or two people involved, do you know what I mean? So they can thrive on that love, the group exercise energy, really. And group exercise is massive for adherence, isn't it? Well, I think any time that you're in a group... Well, here's, here's something from Dr. Dean Ornish. I was talking about this all last week on my tour. Dr. Dean Ornish took a look at a group of population that was up for bypass surgery. Mm -hmm. Now, according to Alan Deutschman in his book Change or Die... Over 97% of people that go for bypass surgery develop brand new blockages within the first couple of years from a behavioral perspective. This is fascinating. These are people who have had to have their bodies cut open. And you think 
after an experience like that, they would say, let me take a look at my habits and rethink yeah. them. They're, they're kind of like, well, no, new arteries, I could start from zero again. I'll be fantastic. And we know this is not the case. So Dean Ornish took a population of people and said, right, one group, we're going to go the traditional route. What we're going to do is give you all the information on prevention and hopefully you won't need surgery. Well, what do you think happened in this group? Well, same thing that happens in every other group. You know, insurance companies give a lot of information and every time you look someplace in the fitness industry, there's all types of information and education on what to eat, what not to eat. They still ate the same foods, did what they always done and they got what they always got and needed heart surgery. The second group, he helped them particip participate in meditation classes, yoga, and stress relieving types of activities to mitigate some of the triggers that lead to the behaviors that result in um, the need for open heart surgery. And then what he also did that was interesting is he put them into a group, just a support group. People who are like you, have the same concerns, same challenges, they're the same age group, people I can relate to who know what I'm going through. Well, what do you think happened in the second group? 77% of the people who were in this se second group, let me repeat that. 77% of the people in this second group did not need bypass surgery because they changed their habits. And three years after the study, in a follow-up, they were still adhering to the same practices and still did not require surgical intervention. Now, that is extraordinary. If you missed it, that is unbelievable. So what do we know? We know things that help to mitigate stress, activities such as yoga, activities such as meditation has an extraordinary benefit on preventing some of the triggers, which is our alternative go-to, because we try to change how we're feeling by engaging in behaviors that are not as good for us. And we know that groups are very powerful in helping people feel connected and people start to take on social mores of the groups that they most want to belong to. In other right. words, birds of a feather flock together. Absolutely. So um, what do you think the future is then? How, how successful do you think these small studios that do, you know, pretty much one thing? You know, if you go to David Lloyd or Virgin Active, you'll get everything. You've got pool, gym, group, in the group, they do all different kinds of classes, whereas these little studios mm -hmm. are pretty much doing one flavor, aren't they? They're doing one small thing. Hot yoga studios, for example, can only do hot yoga. Do you think there's a lifespan? Do you think we'll see them lasting? Well, I think there's some benefits and there's some concerns to that. I, I think that, first of all, let's look at some of the positives and then we'll look at some of the more precarious aspects of starting your own studio. The positives are you want to identify what certain trends are in the industry. And I'm not even going to pretend to know what the future looks like five years or five months from now. Yeah. But I will tell you the trends and you know a few thousand years of human behavior tend to support that anything that involves group exercise, anything that involves movement and play and experience where going to the gym isn't something, oh, I have to do it so I can get to my goal in the future. It's I get to do it. And that process that I want to do, rather than it being an, a, a, a means to an end, a necessary yeah. evil, if you will, is absolutely critical. And I'm not saying group exercise is for everyone. There's a population out there that just doesn't want to do it. It doesn't appeal to them. It's threatening to them. They'll never do it, and that's fine. Mm. But there's also a huge population out there that exercise is not just something they do. That community, the people they do it with, it becomes part of the social circle. It becomes part of their life. So when we're talking yeah. lifestyle changes, group exercise can be very powerful for adherence. But here's the thing you got to look at. If you are going to go, and I'm not going to mention names, if you're going to go the, the method X direction, you might not want to do a million and one things because you're only going to be known for doing one thing savagely well, as Mark Verstegen says. You want to be legendary at something. Mm -hmm. Now, the bad part of that, that is because no one can predict the future. If you don't have a multi-pronged strategy, Mm -hmm. You're in a pretty dangerous position because one thing might take off, one thing might fall flat, and if your whole business plan is on this thing, even if it's a trend, it might be a fad, and only time will bear that out, and if you're on the wrong end of that guess, 
you're in a lot of trouble. Yeah. Also, you have to take a look at the number of people who are buying themselves a job. You know, I know a lot of really great trainers out there that are having what Michael Gerber in his book, The E-Myth, called an entrepreneurial seizure. They are so good at what they do and they make the mistakes that the same skill sets that make them a great yeah. trainer or make them a great entrepreneur. Yeah. And some of those skills transfer. you being a great communicator, being dynamic, infectious, drawing people in. Yes, but you have a whole other set of skills being an entrepreneur that you did not utilize and it's a different mindset and you really have to ask yourself the question, am I that person? I have a friend of mine who owns 10 facilities and they're very upscale and he quips a lot of times because trainers will say to him, I'm going to be just like you. I'm going to open up my mega brand. And he says, well, you know what? Anyone can do what I've done. It's really simple. I mean, this is what business owners don't tell you. It's easy. Um, for the next five years, just be willing to have absolutely no life. Don't have an apartment of your own. Just sleep on the floor of your facility. Wake up every morning, open up your petty cash box and say, well, do I run an advert today or do I eat for the next couple of days? Hmm, what do I do? And if you do that for five years, you'll kind of maybe break even. And over the next five years, just be willing to work 80 hours, 90 hours, sometimes 100 hours a week. And after 10 years, just a simple mm -hmm. decade of this lifestyle, you'll have it made. And that's the reality. You open up a studio, everything that happens in that studio is your responsibility. Yeah. And I've actually met people that didn't even work out before they opened up the studio. How many sessions a week am I going to have to run yeah, to not right. just meet my basic operating expenses, but to turn a profit? So you open up your studio, you need to determine what are all of my expenses. And you're going to kind of have to overestimate this because mm -hmm. however much you think they're going to be, they're going to be a little bit more besides. Yeah. And then how do I plan on filling all of these sessions? And if all I run is a certain brand of training, well, that's great because now you're more specific in terms of what it is you offer, yeah. but you also now appeal to a much smaller market segment. So you've got to be mm -hmm. very, very clear on that because if you're not an entrepreneur and your mindset is not one that allows you to take on a lot of personal risk and invest a lot of your own personal capital, and that doesn't motivate you, that shuts you down. Yeah. Maybe being a studio owner is not for you, and you gotta think about what other alternate streams of income can I build while still in the safety and security of my job, and doing that job very, very well. Yeah. There's a lot out there at the moment. There are so many other streams that, that people can buy into. But, you know, it's whether they're, you, you, they have the entrepreneurial streak and they can see outside of what they do. Tunnel vision is also massive in our industry at the moment. But thank you for that. That was brilliant, brilliant, brilliant today. And um, I shall look forward to speaking to you next week. Well, I'll be here, so. <laughs> Ta-ta for now. Bye -bye.